Good morning and good afternoon around the world. This is Jacob Paulson in Denver, Colorado, coming to you live today with our award-winning and featured author this month in our book group, Phil Simon. Uh, really excited to talk more about uh, big data and Phil's uh, most recent book, Too Big to Ignore. Uh, we've had a great discussion so far and excited to uh, take that to the next level and, and really dive into it today. So appreciate everyone's attendance. Yeah, I know we've. this is kind of a, a new time of day for us to do a webinar. We, I don't think we've ever want, done one this early on a weekday. So I, I think this is a, a new experiment and it appears to be going well. So appreciate everyone who joined us. Uh, first thing we're going to do, just kind of give an introduction. If this is your first time attending a 12 Books webinar, uh, let me quickly just introduce the book group. That's me, that guy with the beautiful family there. And uh, essentially, you know, we, we launched this book group uh, as a collective, you know, group of people who really wanted to take our education uh, to a new level. Uh, you know, ultimately, you know, reading, just reading books wasn't quite cutting it, wasn't really giving us uh, a model where we could uh, learn at a deeper level in a way that we could really apply the material to our lives. And so by fostering a, a larger group discussion, and being led in that discussion by the authors of the books we read, we really feel like this is taking it to the next level. And I, I appreciate all those who have bonded with uh, with me and with the other members and, and, and participated in this way. It's been really exciting. Now, what we promise our members throughout the month, we promise bonus materials. And that's certainly been the case this month. Phil's had some great things for us to read through to, to deepen our understanding of the material. And we promise an online discussion with other group members led by the author. And we host that via Goodreads. And again, uh, Phil's done a great job of being part of that and, and to help help us in that sense understand the material. And of course the live webinar and a chance to win books and other prizes. And we were able to give away 12 signed copies of Phil's book this month. And so for those of you who may have received one or more of those copies, appreciate you you're participating with us and, and hope that you've had uh, a good experience. Quickly, kind of give you an idea of what's coming up. This month, August, of course, we're reading Too Big to Ignore. In September next month, we're going to be reading Getting Ahead by Joel Garfinkel, one of the top 50 executive coaches in America. A really phenomenal book about you know how to take your career to the next level. Uh, the One Thing will be followed up uh, in October with Gary Keller, the, the CEO and founder of Keller Realty. Uh, so that's going to be a really fun and exciting read. Uh, November, we're working on confirming the, the title right now. So hopefully I'll have that announcement in the next couple of days. And then in December, we're going to be reading Mitch Joel's new book, Control-Alt-Delete, uh, which is really, I think, uh, powerful in, in, in terms of what's going on right now in society and where a lot of us may stand. And I think this is going to be an exciting read. And then in January, we'll be with Carl Richards to read more about the behavior gap, uh, simple ways to stop doing dumb things with money. And that sounds pretty intriguing to me. Certainly know I could use the help. So that's kind of what's coming up right now. Very exciting uh, in, in terms of our lineup. If you haven't already plugged into the group discussion on Goodreads, I'd encourage you to do so. Uh, you can get there by going to the bit.ly slash 12 books group. You can go to Goodreads and just search for 12 books, or you can go to 12booksgroup.com slash Goodreads. You know, one way or another, find it, log in, uh, and join the group there so you can be part of the ongoing discussion and, and uh, connect with the other members of the group. That's really where a lot of the value lies. With that then, it's, it's now my opportunity to introduce Phil Simon. Now, I was referred to Phil by another author who had participated in our book group in the past. And when we connected, you know, the, the first thing that uh, I think I was most taken by, Phil, was your, your just immediate willingness to do whatever it took to support our group. And I think uh, you know, we appreciate that you understood our vision and that you wanted to be a part of it and to help us in any way you could. And uh, you know, that, that was really, really appreciated. And, and I was really excited as well uh, just with how quick you were to move and to help and, and to be in place. Uh, I know that we, we kind of connected late in the year uh, for an August, uh, an August read. And I really appreciate you moving so quickly. And, and for those who don't already know much about you, I put your bio up here on the screen. But just thanks again for being part of this and being so willing to support what we do. Well, thank you, Jacob. It's really been a pleasure to get to know you over the last couple months, and I appreciate what you're trying to do with Goodreads and raise the level of discourse and, and move away from 140 characters and, and actually talk about a book. Yeah, that, that, I, I think that uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good summary of really our vision of what we're trying to do. With that, uh, Phil, what I'd like to do is I know that a lot of people who join us on these calls, sometimes they, they're too busy during the course of a month to pick up the book and read it, or perhaps 
uh, you know, they haven't had a chance to finish the book yet. So if you don't mind, take you know five to ten minutes and just kind of give us uh, some of the you know the key points, the, the the takeaways from the book, what you know, why you wrote it, what what could be learned from reading the book, and, and maybe you know what some of those key takeaways are. Sure, thanks, Jacob. I'll take about five to ten minutes and talk a little bit about the book at a high level. Hopefully, touch upon some key themes. And then most of this, I hope, will not be myself talking, but rather having a conversation with other people. Hopefully it's a dialogue, not a monologue. In 2011, I was working on my fourth book, The Age of the Platform, how Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google have redefined business. And so much came out of that book. One of the things that I noticed in looking at those companies, as well as other ones like Twitter and Netflix, is the extent to which they generated an enormous amount of data. And this someone who enjoys writing and looking at sort of the next big thing, it was obvious to me that big data was in fact a big deal. It was becoming, as I write in the book, too big to ignore. The hype cycle around anything these days is typically remarkable. I'm old enough to remember the days in which you would read the newspaper and find out what was going on or, or watch the news. Well now when you pick up a newspaper or watch the news, you already know what happened. Because of social media, we have just seen an absolute proliferation in voices around big data. And I'll admit it, I'm one of them. So there seemed to be a great deal of confusion about this very important term. As I know from my career as a consultant, many organizations are loath to jump on the train for something if they don't know where it's going to go. For that very reason, there was this opportunity, I thought, to write a book that explained, in, in hopefully plain English and avoiding jargon, really what big data was and why it mattered and throw in a few examples. I'm proud of the fact that the book has been generally well received and while I don't think I'll be retiring anytime soon, I'm actually at work on another book right now. Um, it has led me to some interesting places and I've enjoyed writing it. So just to kind of cover the book at a very high level right now, I want to talk a little bit about big data, the definition, the anti-definition, uh, why it matters, and then some examples. Um, there is no shortage of definitions around the term big data. I saw a blog post a couple weeks ago with 37 sort of sanctioned definitions. And early on in the book, I decided that finding the proper or the correct definition wasn't really possible and, and more important, really wasn't necessary. Different software vendors, different thought leaders like myself have vested interest in having their definitions win. So I did my research and found out about how the term big data evolved in the early part of the book. I discussed mobility, the cloud, the drop in storage costs with something called Crider's Law, the fact that we're constantly through social media generating and consuming data, and all the things that went into it. And to me, big data really doesn't have a proper definition, but there's certainly characteristics of big data that I think warrants some discussion here. Uh, first up, big data tends not to be structured. Most of the listeners, I would imagine, at some point have looked at an Excel spreadsheet or a table in a database. And some of those tables are, in fact, quite big. I myself have worked with records of 40 million in looking at certain employee issues with swiping time cards. But that's still not really big data because it's structured, it's orderly, it fits into a database. You can use traditional tools like SQL to query them. With big data, we're really talking about semi-structured and unstructured. In fact, most of the data generated today, around 85%, is on the unstructured variety. By that, I mean it doesn't fall nicely in the spreadsheet. You don't put a spreadsheet uh, or create a spreadsheet with all sorts of photos, right, or YouTube videos or blog posts or, or email. With, an email is actually sort of semi-structured data. So first up, I think it's important to describe that aspect of big data. It is inherently unstructured. Uh, next up, it's really big. Uh, they've actually had to invent terms to describe the amount of data out there. Uh, it used to be, again, I'm old enough to remember that a gigabyte was, was really big. Well, now, I think the smallest hard drive you can buy on eBay is maybe a terabyte. And then there are things like petabytes and exabytes and yogabytes. And it's basically a one with a whole lot of zeros at the end. In fact, they've um, had to invent this new term, broncobyte, which I think is a one with 30 zeros at the end. And we're increasingly generating a tremendous amount of data. Now, if I thought that that was temporary, I may not have written the book. In fact, the amount of data being generated is actually starting to increase even more. I've heard that it's basically doubling every year. Um, I, there's a statistic in a similar book on big data by Rick Smullen called The Human Face of Big Data. 
And the stat that really resonated with me was that the average person these days is ex in an industrialized country is exposed to more data than a person was in the 15th century during his or her entire lifetime. So there's this absolute deluge of information that's just streaming there. Now, why does big data matter? Uh, in short, because there's actually a great deal of signal within that noise. The trick is finding it. Uh, Nate Silver's book, The Signal and the Noise, gets into why some of these predictions fail. And in short, we are ignoring, in many cases, data that does have some value. But how do you find the one tweet out of a million or the one YouTube video? And to that end, the companies that I discuss in the book have really embraced these new tools. Uh, this really isn't a technical book. For those of you who have read it, you'll notice that chapter four is the closest thing to a techie chapter. But if you're not a true techie, I put in the disclaimer that, make a long story short, the old boss, uh, I'm sorry, the new boss isn't the same as the old boss, to paraphrase the who. So tools like Hadoop and NoSQL and NewSQL allow organizations to handle these vast quantities of information. And in the book, I discuss a number of case studies from small companies like Quantcast that serve up advertising metrics to healthcare facilities like the one based out of the Cleveland Clinic, Explorus, even to large organizations like NASA. Just because an organization has an $18 billion a year budget doesn't mean that it should do everything internally. In fact, in the book, I talk about ways to get a little bit pregnant with big data. Tools like a top coder or Kaggle let you dip your toe in the water without spending millions of dollars on pricey consultants. So the book has, I think, a decent number of examples and at the end of the book, and, and I'll stop talking in a few minutes here, I, I do discuss some of the downsides. To me, this would have been irresponsible if you're talking about an era of big data in which governments can spy on you through things like PRISM or Facebook knows what you're saying and Google knows what you're doing, not addressing the elephants in the room, i.e. privacy and security, I think would have been remiss. So hopefully the book is a very well-rounded overview of the trend. To make a long story short, I have no crystal ball. Uh, the new book that I'm working on is on data visualization, so how do you take this information and then turn it into um, a more usable format and then understand problems better and make better decisions. So that's sort of a high-level overview in about 10 minutes, and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you have. Thank you, Phil. I, I, you know, as I'm, I'm thinking, as you go through that, you know, it really kind of brings my mind back to the reading. Uh, as you're kind of going through it, I'm thinking of each chapter and some of the big uh, major takeaways. Uh, and in my mind, you know, this this is big. You know, I I, I hate to use the cliche, but I see that the topic on the, uh, the other day I saw it on the cover of uh, Information Weekly. Uh, it seems to be everywhere. People are talking about big data, and uh, part of that struggle for me when we when you and I first connected is well, what is it? So I appreciate you know talking through that definition, and and that puts things foundationally, you know, at a point where we can we can start to understand it and go through it. So that, that yeah, was I think it was Winston on. Churchill who said success begins with a common understanding of terms. Uh, I've Googled that more than once, and for some reason it's not him. And it just seems like too smart a quote for me to have said. But yes, I, I agree with you, whether it was in the previous book, The Age of the Platform, if I don't explain sort of the central concept of the book in a way that people can understand, uh, because there's so much noise around it, I just thought that it would have been not really laying the foundation for the rest of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, with with that, I think we're going to go ahead and kind of transition. I already have some questions popping in, popping in, so we're going to start to address those. And for those of you who have not been on our uh, webinars in the past, let me kind of describe how this is going to work and, and what this is going to look like. So essentially, you know, as we for the live question and answer, I will be posing most of the questions. Uh, to Phil, a couple of people have already emailed me with questions. They're not going to be able to attend until they've had some of these questions they, and they've sent them to me. Uh, but for those of you who are here live with us, you have two options if you want to ask a question. Your first option is to use the questions tool, which you see over there on the right-hand side of the screen in the GoToWebinar uh, tool interface. Uh, you can just type your question in right there and hit Submit or Send, and that sends it over to me, and I, I will be able to, to read that out loud uh, to the group and to Phil, and he'll be able to respond to it. The other option is if you're, if you're on a phone or if you're in front of a computer that has a microphone and you want to just talk, if you just want to speak out loud, then you can click on the little icon that looks like a hand, the little orange hand. If you click on that, uh, that shows me on my end that you would, you would like to speak, and then I'll call on you in order 
and uh, and unmute your your line so that you can just you know talk out loud and and uh, you know speak directly to Phil and ask your question. So that's where we'll go from from here. And uh, I want to go ahead and get get cranking. So Phil, I got the first question for you. You ready? Yes. So someone asks, what is the half life of data? <laughs> There's a great line from. Oh gosh, uh, Abertson's book, oh, I read it about a year ago, and it applied to medical students. And the line was something along the lines of um, teachers telling the students, enjoy what you're learning, because in 10 years, you're going to have to forget half of it. And I <laughs> really struck a chord with me. Um, certain data, I would argue, is always going to be useful, right? But then there's other data that's contextual. A simple example might be a list of your customers, a list of your employees. It's really hard for me to envision in a point in the future at which not knowing that information is acceptable. Uh, many organizations, as I point in the book, struggle with this sort of basic data management. Um, however, there, there's other information that arguably is contextual. What's trending right now? Well, people may not care about that in six months or a year or ten years. The beauty with the drop-in storage for data is that you don't have to make some of those decisions. There's a startup that I mentioned towards the end of the book. I think it's Volt DB, but there are a bunch of them, so don't quote me on that. But the head of the company more or less believes that data does have a half-life, and you don't really want to store it in the traditional sense. You're only interested in it now and what it can do for you now. So that's a little bit of a conceptual question, but I would argue that it, we can probably agree on this. Certain information will always be valuable. Um, certain information may be more temporal. But because data storage costs have dropped so much, like I mentioned before, go ahead and try to find a, a 50 gig um, hard drive on eBay. Um, it's become basically a commodity. Sites like Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure or Rackspace allow you to access tremendous compute power and data storage. So I think it's a valid question, but you don't necessarily have to make the decision on what you need to store if you start embracing some of these new tools. Yeah, that that makes sense, uh, and it it is uh, sometimes perhaps a little intimidating when you start to think through some of those things. But uh, the, the cost of data storage clearly is a big a big factor here. Here's a good question: uh, Can you have small amounts of big data and expect your company to grow, or do you always need big amounts of big data in order to grow? I'd say that it's more the first one. Um, I certainly think that it helps to have more information, but one of the myths that I debunk in the book and in one of the posts, Jacob, that you put on the site on the 11 myths of big data is that you don't need it all. Certainly if you're looking at trends, you're a company like Netflix, another really impressive big data company. Um, you might have enough from just a small sample, right? I'm not a statistician, but I remember taking the course in school. You can make certain inferences based on a subsample of data. Right? You can be 95% confident with a sample of 10,000 or something. You don't necessarily need a sample of a million or 10 million. And this gets into something that Nate Silver talks about in his book. There is this difference between doing samples and grabbing all of the data. Uh, there is, a, I would argue, a diminishing return on, on grabbing all of the data. But as a general rule, I would rather have more data than less. You, yes, you absolutely can have small amounts of big data. If you wanted to download you know, 10,000 photos or 10,000 videos or look at uh, a relatively small number of records, then you still can draw conclusions from that. But all else equal, I'm a big believer that it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. The problem, I think, with restricting your sample size is that you may be oblivious to emerging trends. Because things can happen so quickly, I think it's um, in the, the previous book, I talk about the futility of planning. There, there's a quote from Jerry Brown, everyone likes to plan because no one has to do anything. I just think that we are moving strongly away from this sort of set it and forget it mentality. Things can break very quickly. We've all heard of things trending on Twitter or flash sales. Um, it's very difficult to, I think, sit back and say, well, it's going to be this way for the next two to three years. So you can have small amounts of big data, and you can do some interesting things with it. Uh, there are diminishing returns, but again, if you can store this information, and it's not terribly expensive, and there's a benefit to doing it, I would argue really what's what's the downside. Sure. Yeah, it's it's more of a why not than a why in many ways. Yeah, I like that. Uh, here's here's a question that I'm particularly. Uh, 
fond of. I, I'm, I'm interested in the answer. And uh, the essential question is, is there pending legislation, national or international, that could affect big data? Oh, that's a big question. The short answer is that within the U.S., I don't know if anything is targeting big data per se, but if you look at privacy regulations in the U.S. compared to, say, Europe, they're very different. Uh, here in the U.S., we have more of what they call a sectoral approach. For instance, for healthcare or financial services, we have, as a society, made the decision that those industries can not regulate themselves, but we don't necessarily have this global, all-encompassing policy. In Europe, it's very different. Europe tends to take privacy much more seriously than we do here. That doesn't mean that it's perfect or that, that breaches don't happen, but I, again, without being that attuned to what's going on in Washington, would be shocked if, if given things like PRISM or like some of the breaches with uh, uh, Zappos or hacks for Facebook. I mean, look at yesterday, right? The New York Times site went down from the, the Syrian um, hacking group or something like that. So I would ask, you know, I don't know of any specifically in the United States. I'm not that politically attuned, but I would eat my hat if there wasn't some resolution right now in one of the houses surrounding what to do about big data. It's not the first time, nor will it be the last, that technology has advanced far faster than our institutions. I mean, as I told some of my friends sometimes, I have no desire to be a lawyer, but if I did, I think that social media is absolutely fascinating. Where does your right, where do your rights as a citizen start and your rights as an employee begin? In other words, if you go out and have some fun and you're wearing a company t-shirt, at a ball game and you get drunk and someone takes a video of you and posts it on Vine or on YouTube and your boss finds out and fires you, did you have an expectation of privacy? So I don't have the answers to those questions. I'm not trying to reflect, um, deflect it. My only point is that, uh, how do I put this politely? Uh, politicians maybe aren't as a general group the most technologically savvy of all people and this stuff is changing so quickly that um, there's a reason, right? that a lot of the Washington is reaching out to people like Larry Page and Mark Zuckerberg and Cheryl Stamber. They're closer to technology. Honestly, the politicians need help in understanding what's going on. So I'm sure there are laws, whether or not they're the right laws. I, I, I can't imagine getting into that. We'd have to do that over here sometime. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, Jay has asked, uh, how long does it take to see the business benefit from a big data project, and how much does it typically cost at the low end? Okay, um, I first off have a problem with the term big data project. If you look at Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, Netflix, they don't think of projects uh, in the traditional sense. In other words, if you're looking at blowing out a, an ERP or a CRM system or implementing a business intelligence solution, those for the most part were projects. There was a start date, there was an end date. Uh, big data, I would argue, is more of a cultural mindset. Right? What's the value of big data at Google or Facebook? I would argue it's impossible to measure. Facebook just crossed $100 billion in market valuation. If you take away data, I'd be shocked if Facebook was worth even a tenth of that. So in terms of how long it takes to recognize value from a big data project, there's really no answer. The short answer is it depends. Um, I think it was um, uh, Peter Drucker who said that culture eats strategy for lunch. So I would argue that the odds of a big data endeavor or project or whatever you want to call it, succeeding at Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, and Netflix are considerably higher than a traditional mid-sized hospital with all the regulations and cultural baggage. And, and I say that not to slam hospitals. I've worked in and out of hospitals for around 10 years as a consultant, but it's just a different culture. Um, so I specifically avoided in the book the ROI question. I think that it's very pernicious to say, well, we're not going to do this unless our ROI is going to be 14%. How do you know, right? Uh, in the book, I write about how, the importance of really crawling before you can walk. Some organizations have better internal data management practices, and as such, I would argue they would realize the benefits a lot quicker than companies that are, quite frankly, dysfunctional. Um, however, this is also important to note, because of big data and the cloud and software as a service, no longer does the entire organization need to be on board. We're seeing a lot of adoption in organizations, not covered in the book, sort of from the bottom up, not necessarily from the top down. You don't need the imprimatur of a chief executive to get started. In pockets of the organization, you might, you might get going while corporate figures things out. So I hate to give the stock consulting answer, but it really does depend.
Yeah, no, that's fair. Uh, you know, and you bring up. The, I love the you know the, the the point you made about culture, and I think that's that's kind of probably the biggest takeaway. Uh, another question is outside of the HR component, how can something like an engineering firm use big data to grow? Maybe I could get a little bit more information about the engineering firm because is it a you know when I think of engineers, I think of computer engineers, I think of mechanical and electrical engineers. Um, mm. Is there a particular context that they, I mean, if, this is an example here. I reached out to a firm in Las Vegas researching the new book, and they were able to use big data and data visualization to do some interesting things around utilities. So I know that we are seeing adoption in different industries, but, you know, to me, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but an engineering firm just seems a little um, vague. And, and, and Denise just responded. She said it's an engineering and design firm, if that's helpful. Okay, I mean, I guess, is there a particular design project? I mean, look, if you look at what Marissa Meyer does over at Yahoo when she, since she's taken over, and she's really irritated quite a few people, but I understand why she's doing it. There was a great unofficial or unauthorized biography online on Marissa Meyer that I read this week, and it's really long. I think it's about 10,000, 12,000 words. But she comes from sort of a design engineering background. So when she came over to Yahoo, and even when she was at Google, she would consistently use what they call A-B or split testing to evaluate different decisions. And I mentioned this in the book. It's under, uh, I forget which chapter. It might be chapter five, the elements, no, chapter three, the, the elements chapter of three. Yeah, the elements of persuasion. Uh, you can use, if you're a design firm, depending on the project, right, you don't want to build two bridges and see which one of them crashes, right? <laughs> That's probably not the way most engineers would want to work. But if you're a software engineer or you're a designer, you can modify individual aspects of, let's say, a web page. Google and Amazon do this. They run these split tests for 10, 20,000 people, and they'll see which people respond better based on the color of the font or the type of font or the location of a particular image. If you look at the history of Google's homepage, it's remained relatively spartan over the last 15 years, but there absolutely have been some changes. It does look a little dated if you go back to 2000 or 1998. So design firms can, I would argue, use A-B testing with regard to Marissa Meyer, she's, as I said, ticked some people off because plenty of designers sort of subscribe to this Steve Jobs notion of the purity of the art and the design and the mission. And Steve Jobs never used um, focus groups, right? Um, Isaacson makes that point in, in his biography of Steve Jobs, which, which I highly recommend. It's, it's really a good book. Um, Marissa Meyer comes at it from a very different perspective. She wants to test the hell out of everything and that really irritates certain people. So I'm not saying it's good or bad, but you can, I think, test different components. In the book, I talk about Eric Reese from The Lean Startup and how he A-B tested the title and cover of his book. Now, I actually wanted to do that uh, for this one, but my publisher wasn't keen on it, and I try not to make enemies of the people who are publishing my book. So um, to me, the question is, how can you use it, not why can't you use it? That's, I think that's fair. Uh, you know, and along those lines, another question that came in that's, that's similar. So maybe we should we should bring this up to the to the top right now. And someone asked, "Have you run into any industries that, generally speaking, are performing really well or very poorly as it relates to the use of big data?" Yes, and yes. Uh, with regard to doing it well, if you look at the tech sector, for lack of a better term, I, I really do think they're leading the pack. No, not every company has Amazon, Apple, Facebook, or Google, but those companies, and I'm probably a little biased because I wrote an entire book on the Gang of Four, uh, the age of the platform, but as I said, that book sort of led into this one. Uh, it's just astonishing. Uh, as in the book, I, I, did, I make reference to an Eric Schmidt quote, quote. At the time, he was the CEO of Google. Now he's the chairman of the board. He said, basically, we know where you are. We know what you're doing. We know what you're thinking. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, that's a hell of a comment, and I'm sure that he actually regretted saying it, but again, Google in the tech sector in general, I think, generally speaking, is doing a better job. There's a reason, right, that the government asked Microsoft and Yahoo and the Gang of Four to turn over records for part of PRISM, right? What companies, what industries weren't they asking? Well, they really weren't asking retail, right? That's not a slam against retail. It's just that they're not doing uh, the same job that tech, tech, the technology industry is. Uh, with regard to not doing it well, again, I'm going to take a shot here at healthcare. There are absolutely um, organizations that get it, but when you think about the state of healthcare, and I don't want to turn this into a rant, but we spend, what, 17% of our, 
of our GDP on healthcare. It's over three trillion dollars a year. Yet the system is so broken. So to me, there's just tremendous opportunity uh, with regard to healthcare. But as a general rule, I, I would argue that most healthcare organizations, individually, much less as a whole, don't do small data management well. And for them, big data would be like not, um, you know, not knowing how to drive and, and taking a Ferrari on a speedway. Right, baby steps. And someone commented here, uh, Denise commented that uh, she feels like travel and tourism industries have been doing very well for many years with big data. Yeah, I suppose that it would depend. I think that 15 years ago that would have been tough to say, but if you, took, if you take a look at the proliferation of sites like Expedia and Travelocity, um, not to mention if you think about open and linked data, sites like Airbnb that will connect you to Facebook, um, I, I would agree they are, again, not as a general rule, but there probably are some industry, um, I'm sorry, some companies within that industry that are doing better than others. Looking at open data, there's a company called Decide.com, and they are able to pull all sorts of data from different flights so they can actually recommend, not just find the lowest flight, right? Kayak can, can do that um, as an example. But when should you buy a flight? So if you crunch the numbers and look at all, all these streams of information, is there an ideal time to buy that, to buy that first class ticket from Bermuda to Las Vegas. And before you're about to hit buy, you get a little pop-up that says, well, based on our data, we think this is going to go down by 20% in two weeks. So feel free to buy it, but if I were you, I'd wait. So there absolutely are, uh, thank you, Denise, for the question, uh, pockets. I, you know, This is not a short book. This is my shortest book, but many business books these days are 180 or 200 pages. I intentionally kept this book short to make it more readable. My second book with Wiley, The Next Wave of Technologies in Hindsight, was probably a little bit too long, which did help its commercial viability. But trust me, this book could have been, as Jacob and I were talking about a little earlier, twice as long as it was. Uh, and maybe there will be more big data books from me. And, and I know that it's a very popular topic. The last time I checked, there were something like 150 big data books coming up this year on Amazon. Oof. Wow. Now, and there's a question about that here in the queue, but uh, I'll, I'll get to it in a minute. That, that's... I appreciate that response. I feel like, you know, thinking about industries that sometimes, uh, you know, certainly we'd like to believe that there's companies in any industry that are doing a good job, uh, but it's it's good to know that, you know, there are some industries that have just kind of figured it out and they're, they're ahead of the game. And, and I think that, you know, it's good to have a leader uh, in anything. Well, if you Here's think about it, everyone's, um, everyone trumpets the virtue of first mover advantage, but Google wasn't the first engine. Facebook wasn't the first social network. Right? Amazon has never led in a product category. The iPod wasn't the first MP3 player. Right? And the iPad wasn't the first tablet. The iPhone certainly wasn't the first cell phone. Uh, if you take a look, and I always screw this one up, but UPS and FedEx are always in this battle. I, I want to say that FedEx typically leads, and by design, UPS takes a step back and says, all right, let's see what FedEx did well, what they didn't do well, because then they're what they would call a, a fast second, and they jump in. So. I can understand why many companies are gun shy, uh, particularly in a slow economy, particularly when IT budgets are stagnant, if not decreasing. Uh, but I argue in, in a recent post that now is the perfect time to jump in because people are still trying to figure things out. You could conceivably put some distance between yourself and your competitors precisely because they are dragging their feet. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, I think that's uh, it's, it's the opportunity that exists. Here's a good question. Uh, this one's from uh, Jay. What is the learning curve to become a data scientist? What's the <laughs> difference between a quant, Q-U-A-N-T, and I feel embarrassed I don't know what that word means, and a data scientist? Okay. Uh, a couple things. That's a great question. Thank you, Jay. Uh, I think that Jay means, and, and feel free, uh, Jacob, to ask uh, Jay directly, but uh, there's an interesting book called The Quants that came out, I want to say, a year, year and a half ago, about basically quantitative Wall Street analysts who do amazing things with numbers to identify the precise time to buy and sell an equity. Um, in fact, certain hedge funds have moved their offices and spent tens of millions of dollars closer to, say, Chicago or New York so that when the um, trades go through, they have literally a, a few microsecond advantage over a firm that's in, say, San Diego or Oklahoma. So I want to make sure that Jay and I are talking about the same thing before I distinguish. Is that what he means by a quant, or is, am I using the term in a different way? Uh, yep, that's correct. Yeah, so a quant tends to have this Wall Street type mentality. 
Uh, traditionally, quants, and I'm no expert on Wall Street, my investment record would prove that. Trust me, I'm the guy who bought Apple at 675. Um, quants, I think, historically have dealt with uh, large amounts of small data, but again, that's changing. If you look at companies like Ravenpack, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the book or not, but Ravenpack, and, and there are some companies that do this as well, essentially aggregate all sorts of different data sources to determine sentiment. For example, what are people saying on Twitter? What are people writing about in blog posts or, or conceivably in Facebook or LinkedIn. Now, that's not the same as a particular stock order, right? A Phil buys 20 shares of Apple at 675 on such and such a date. That's very neat. It's easy to aggregate that information. But what's the sentiment uh, on the web? And not that somebody tweeting could conceivably bring down the value of the stock, but what if 20 or 30 or 50,000 people are tweeting about how Apple isn't innovating anymore? and it's getting retweeted all the time. And does that sort of weigh on your conscience as an investor? I'm not an expert, I don't know, but again, getting back to this notion, Jacob, of better to have it and not need it, if I did run a hedge fund and I could quantify investor sentiment, why wouldn't I build that into my model? So the data scientist, to get back to Dave's question, uh, does not, in my opinion, completely overlap with the quant. Data scientist is this really hot term, and I spoke um, a couple of months ago here in Las Vegas, and one of the questions came up around, data science, and I said, I don't have any children, but if I had a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old looking to go to college, I would say, study data science because it's an incredibly hot field right now. And it's sort of this hybrid between some of the skills possessed by a quant, but also a statistics background, maybe a little bit of data modeling, business background doesn't hurt. If you're a scientist, I can think of worse things to be. So it's this amalgam of all these different fields, and because there's so much information, Another myth around big data is that intuition is dead. I, I could not agree less. It really helps if you do have a starting point. You're looking at these vast data sets, unprecedented amounts of data. You kind of need a starting point. But if you don't have some of those skills, I can look at a huge data set and say, what's driving my book sales, right, hypothetically. And I can, quote, unquote, prove that when I write for Huffington Post, I have a spike in book sales, right? Well, that might be true, but is that the only reason? Is that the major reason? One of my favorite quotes, and I think this one in the book, is if you torture the data long enough, it will submit. So knowing which questions to ask, how to sort of manage this, I think is going to become increasingly important. So data science, I think to me, um, doesn't necessarily have a connotation of a Wall Street analyst, and they, I'm not saying you couldn't take a quant and put him or her in a data scientist role and that person would be lost. But I actually have friends who are data scientists and they do have this sort of hybrid background and they don't necessarily just focus on the financial industry. Talk a little bit more, Phil, about uh, you know the process. Is, is data science, is it a, is that a, is there, can you earn a degree in data science? Is this a learned skill? You know, what does it look like? Three years ago, if you'd said, what's data science, someone would have said, I don't understand, much like big data. I only heard the term, I, I don't know, 18 months ago, 19 months ago. Uh, if you look at Google Trends and you compare data, big data and data science versus, say, business intelligence or even Britney Spears, uh, you will see that <laughs> the last two have a much higher frequency. But data science is growing. To answer your question, Jacob, yes, schools are starting to realize that if they want to charge for an undergrad degree, Forty-five to fifty thousand dollars a year, or grad school even more than that, then they need to keep up with the times. So at Carnegie Mellon, my undergraduate alma mater, as I write in the book, now I believe offers a concentration in data science with under one of the schools for a graduate degree. Uh, MIT, I believe, does the same thing. So I'd be shocked if very technical schools like MIT and Caltech don't realize that if they want their students to get high paying jobs, offering a concentration or formal degree in data science wouldn't be the worst thing they can do. And more to the point, if they're looking to attract top talent, these are some really smart people and if they start companies, they may donate right into the endowment. So it's sort of a keeping up with the Jones situation. Many universities, to my knowledge, were a little bit reluctant to jump on that train, but now that big data has exploded and people like me are writing books about it, I do think that in many universities and colleges, they are taking a look at what they're offering. Hopefully, they're not just rebranding it. Um, some people think that data science is just another term for statistician or analyst, and 
you know, to me, if it looks like a duck or walks like a duck, it's a duck. But a true data scientist, and I, I was just speaking with one the other day from Netflix, um, they really do possess a variety of skills. It's not just a statistician reincarnated. Sure. No, I, I think uh, there's a lot of interest around that. I mean, one of the most kind of compelling things that I took away from the book was, you know, I think it was maybe chapter one or chapter two when you talked about, you know, the upcoming employment opportunities for people in this field. I thought, man, I've got to get my kids plugged in. So, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I you know, it's um, a compelling question. Yeah, it, it, to me, it's not just about deploying the best technology. That There needs to be the culture that accepts it. As I write in the book, if your organization has historically resisted small data, then what are the odds they're going to go, oh, well, now this makes sense. Um, so I like to think, and, and I put this on my, my website, that I sort of arrive at the nexus of data technology, people, and business. And hopefully the book isn't just a, a pure tech book. I, again, chapter four is definitely on the techie side, but I really do try to write about the human and business and sort of sociological aspects of it. Um, we are becoming more comfortable generating and consuming data. I go, go, when I go to the gym, I'm astonished when I look around. Everybody is wearing some type of tech, and if you look at Fitbit or Google Glass or some of the other emerging wearable technologies, um, this is just going to get bigger, never mind machine learning, which is an entirely different discussion. Right. Uh, Phil, quickly, can you uh, tell me again the name of the book that you had mentioned about the Wall Street analyst? It's called The Quants. The Quants, okay. Okay, someone had asked. Yeah, let me, I'm Googling it right now. It's called um, How a New Breed of Math Whizzes Conquered Wall Street and Nearly Destroyed It, and it's by uh, Scott Patterson, and I thought it was, um, I thought it was excellent. It, it does talk a little bit about the um, technical side and trading and, and some things that were really beyond my interest, but I thought it did explain very well the extent to which we're relying upon data. Yes, as I said before, intuition still matters, but why not augment your intuition with real information? Right, absolutely. Uh, we're we're going to start running out of time, so I'm picking through some of these questions and, and I want to make sure we get to some of the best ones. Um, Let's see here. Should we be? Uh, here's a good one. Should we be investing in any big data, big data providers or companies? Someone's looking for some some investing advice here. <laughs> All right. I'm going. To, I'm not an attorney, but um, anything that I can say from this point forward does not constitute investing advice. In fact, um, think of me as the anti Warren Buffett. If I say buy something, you should probably sell it. I am just not good at. <laughs> for whatever reason, <laughs> uh, making investment decisions. But I want to say six or eight months ago, a company called Splunk went public, and they're a big data play. I'm not telling you to buy them or to sell them. I'm just saying that they're out there. Uh, more than sort of big data startups, uh, Tableau is a data visualization company with probably the coolest stock symbol for a geek like me. It's dollar sign data. Um, that's another public <laughs> one. But beyond just looking at specialized companies, Jacob, uh, think about companies that have embraced big data. Like I said, forget Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google. In companies like SAP, Oracle, IBM uh, have really, I think, under, started to understand big data. I was very surprised researching the book about the extent to which Hadoop, which is sort of the de facto standard for quote-unquote managing big data, even though I don't like that term, integrates with existing Microsoft, Oracle, and SAP products. In effect, those companies have said, we're not trying to fight this. We're trying to see if our products can seamlessly integrate with newer products like Hadoop. Uh, but I would be shocked if in the next three to five years we don't see a decent number of big data startups. Uh, unfortunately, Facebook sort of poisoned the well, even though it's rebounded and now it's over its initial um, opening price from last May. Uh, many companies, including Skitter, uh, Twitter, are skittish about going public because they, they don't want to see things drop down. So I, I, please don't take any of my investing advice seriously, but there are companies out there publicly traded beyond Amazon, um, Apple, Facebook, and Google that are doing interesting things with big data on the technology side. Yeah, absolutely. Here's a, here's a question, and I'll call it a comment because I, I think it may be rhetorical, uh, but uh, someone did ask, has there been any predictive analysis done on Miley Cyrus's performance at VMA looking at the sentiment from the Twitter feeds? So I, I, I think we, we can just kind of laugh and move on, but 
uh, you know, the, there's uh, some, some always a wave, right? There's always right. Well, I, I can't imagine the business value in that, but here's the point. If you asked that question 15 years ago, forget the fact that there wasn't Twitter. There was really no way to do that. Uh, now, because of blogs and social media sites and mobility and all the things that we talk, uh, just talk about in the book, if, if you, I guess here's the point. If you want to do something like that, you can, which to me really does, I think, stress the need for I'll put in a shameless plug for, for books like mine or for data scientists or for thought leaders or for going to conferences and listening to people and finding out about the way that they, they've done things. I really don't believe that there's a checklist for getting a great deal out of big data. I am very proud of the fact that in this book I, I don't lay out a 10-point plan and say if you follow these 10 steps, you'll be the next Google. Uh, one of my favorite business books is called The Halo Effect by Phil Horsenstein. I always screw up his last name. But to make a long story short, um, it's very dangerous to look retroactively and say, oh, well, if we do these five things, then we'll be successful. Jim Collins, who wrote Good to Great, had to essentially repudiate his theory and write that book, Why the Mighty Fall. So I'm telling you as a probabilistic thinker that if you follow the advice in the book, all else equal, you should see some results. But by no means is it any sort of recipe or checklist. I, big, big, big data doesn't guarantee success. Uh, even if you listen to, hopefully, people who know what they're talking about, like I do. Yeah, no, that's fair. I, I think uh, you know, at a certain level, you know, business is part of part of taking risks, right? And then, uh, you know, big data could be viewed that way, but certainly, uh, I don't think it's it's hopeless. It's more of an ROI thing. Which you know, Jay actually asked a, a follow up question to what we were talking about earlier. Uh, there's always a there's always a conflict between labor and capital. Do you think we're going to have a similar conflict between data and profits? I didn't think I'd be talking about Karl Marx, but let's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's bring it. I, I do. In fact, I, I talk about that in Chapter 7. It's certainly, to me, not as big of a deal as privacy or security, but there are plenty of people, and, and I read about some in the book, of course I anonymized them, that quite frankly do feel threatened about by big data, right? I mean, it's always been the case. Melvin Kranzberg famously said technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Technology, over the course of just since the Internet, uh, has disintermediated people like bank tellers and travel agents, right? So there will be, I think, that conflict. What happens when a machine can suggest that you look into something? What happens when a 25-year-old who's skilled at Google Analytics can tell you exactly what's going on, more so than a 50-year-old VP who's looking at retirement, and that the VP costs three times as much for salary? What happens when tools supplant people? This isn't a, a Terminator-type book. But I, I agree, but I would also argue that as a student of technology, this really isn't anything new. Um, yes, terms like exabytes and yottabytes are new. No one even heard of them two or three years ago, present company included. But this conflict between people and machines, I think, has been with us for a very long time. And I'm sure it'll be at there after, you know, after we stop talking about big data and talk about the next shiny new thing. I really don't see that going anywhere. That's fair. Uh, Phil, uh, we're running out of time here. I'm going to ask, I think we have time for probably two more questions. Uh, so as a follow-up for people who have, who have read, the, you know, read the book and are excited about the topic, you know, what other books would you recommend about big data? I know you've already mentioned a couple, but I thought we'd just revisit sure. it quickly. Okay. Um, the big book on big data by Rick Smolin, and I forget the name of the other woman. Um, it's an amazing book. It's, it's very different. It's a coffee table book. It weighs about eight pounds. Uh, but I thought that it was really interesting because it has a ton of different examples. And it is, you know, my only complaint is that it's, I think there is a Kindle version, but it's really difficult to actually carry around. So I, I wouldn't put it in your backpack. It may not fit. That was a good one. I haven't read the, the big data book by uh, Victor, I think it's Schoenstein, but I've heard good things. I think that's more about the sort of societal impact. Um, I worked very hard and very furiously with my publisher to get this book out as soon as possible because I knew that there was going to be a spate of big data books out there. And to me, this book does, I felt very strongly talking to my acquisitions editor about the title and the subtitle. I, I really do feel like this book, without getting into specific ROI calculations, does lay out the business case for big data. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Nate Silver book, The Signal and the Noise. That isn't about big data per se. It's about making predictions. It's in an ancillary way about big data, but I still think that it's a, an important book to read because it's fundamentally about information and what to do with it. Um, Super Crunchers by Ares, Ares, I forget the, how you pronounce his name, but 
Super crunchers I thought was really interesting. It gets into some of the different applications of these large data sets. So hopefully that will keep people busy. I, um, I do read a lot. I explain to people my theory of writing I'm like a sponge. I read and read and watch and, and talk, and eventually I have enough in my head that I have to squeeze out a book. <laughs> that sounds like a good strategy. Uh, I think we'll take this as our last question, Phil. Someone asked uh, about, you know, we talked earlier about, about culture, and as a follow-up, what kind of culture does an organization need to succeed with data? Flexible. What are the key uh, components? Uh, flexibility, uh, tolerance for failure. When I think about certain organizations, and I go back to my consulting days, I can think of specific projects in which nothing ever went right. And we would craft this miracle recovery plan of these 46 steps that needed to take place. And let's say that each step had a 90% chance of being successful. Well, 0.9 to the 46th power is zero. The odds that all 46 things would go right are basically null. So what's the point of doing that, particularly in a culture that penalizes people for making mistakes. Um, so when I think about companies that have embraced failure, like Google, right, like, say, Facebook, they know that when they throw something out there, it isn't the final version, right? If you look at how Twitter's evolved, the first version of Twitter didn't ship with the retweet button. It didn't, there was no hashtag. Those all came from the community. So, excuse me, aside from a tolerance of failure, outward-looking companies that realize that there are smart people that actually don't work for them, I think all else equal will benefit. Companies that recognize that traditional databases and data marts and data warehouses may not be the right way to go. Those that look at application programming interfaces, APIs, those that are curious, those that ask questions, those with ambitious goals. Say what you want about Elon Musk. You can't say that the guy lacks ambition. So if you put all those things together, you can still, quote unquote, fail with big data. But when I think about the organizations, Jacob, that penalize people for making a mistake when they're entering this completely different world of big data, uh, I can imagine how I would be very reluctant to take a risk. And to go back to something that you said, you're absolutely right. Um, big data is still risky. There's no guarantee that you're going to do it right. So I don't, no one likes to fail, but I guess they say fail quickly and fail um, forward and then learn from them. And I, think, I think that's a good summary in terms of you know, an, action, an action point and what we need to do moving forward. Uh, I, I, get, I get kind of excited about, uh, about big data. I'm a little bit geeky, uh, though not, not nearly as educated in the industry as you are, Phil. And I just think that uh, you know, this is an opportunity uh, where, where you know, really exciting things can happen. Um, last year in our book group, we read The Power of Habit. And there's a chapter there where the author talks about uh, you know the, the pregnancy prediction uh, data that Target uh, oh yeah yeah that's uh, uh, that's you know, made in, uh, famous for yeah that's in chapter eight uh, it's it's a well told yeah, uh, in your book as well yeah, yeah an off told so, story yeah it's and so that that really kind of piqued my interest and that's where it really got the ball rolling for me and I, I know that many other uh, members of the group were very excited and I just want to say thank you one more time for your support. Uh, here with us today, and, and thanks to everyone who has uh, sent in questions, you know, live or or previously. If you're listening to this recording, I thought those were some really good questions. And, and Phil, I think your your responses were, were were spot on, and and exactly what we needed to hear. So thank you again. Thanks a lot, Josh, and to everyone. Thank you for participating, and I'd appreciate appreciate any honest review on on Goodreads and Amazon, uh, even if you don't like it. If as long as it's honest, that's fine with me. <laughs> Sounds good. With that, uh, then, we'll, we'll start to conclude for, for today. I've pushed up on the screen for everybody uh, Phil's website, uh, Twitter and Facebook handles. And I would, you know, Phil's, your website is absolutely fantastic. I would encourage people, if they haven't already, I know I sent out the link via email to the, the membership earlier this month. But if you haven't already, go there, check it out. I love uh, how, it's, how easy it is to uh, navigate the blog you know, based on the category and the topic that you're looking for. Uh, Phil's an expert in so many different areas. And so check out Phil's website, subscribe there if you haven't already so that you can stay plugged in. And, uh, and, and I'll echo, as Phil said, of course, that as you, as you come to the end of your reading, if you haven't already, uh, please you know, visit Amazon and Goodreads and share your, your honest and sincere review about the book uh, to help future readers. Uh, thank you, everyone. From Denver, Colorado, this is Jacob Paulson. Uh, good afternoon and good night.